Hello, this is Serene from Exam Help Lab. Today I'll be solving Cambridge International AS and AN Level Physics 9702 paper 1, we're in 2 February March 2022. Question number 1 What could not be a measurement of a physical quantity? Um, option A shows us Kelvin, which is a, uh, which is a unit of temperature that is a physical quantity. So A is out. Um, uh, option B, which is energy, because joules is in energy, and this could be joules over newton meter, where newton meter is moment. So joules could be further divided into, which is energy, energy is equal to force into distance. So this could be divided into force into distance, divided by newton meter could again be divided into kilograms meters per second square into meters right everything cancels out so uh, this could be our answer but uh, let's move on to the next two options we'll see so option c it has pressure because pascals is for pressure into meter cube is for volume divided by newton per newton means that newton has to be in the denominator and newton represents force now pressure is further divided into force over area multiplied by volume over force now force and force gets cancelled and volume could be further divided into area into length right divided by area area in area gets cancelled and length is a physical quantity so this way c is out too and part D is in terameters, which is a um, unit for distance, so definitely D out. So our answer is B. All right. Now, a computer memory stick is labeled as having a storage capacity of 128 gigabytes. The letter B stands for byte, which is a unit. What is the equivalent storage capacity? So a giga is 10 to the power of 9. Giga is represented by 10 to the power of 9 so 128 multiplied by 10 to the power of 9 is equivalent to 1.28 into 10 to the power of 11 bytes all right so this concludes that our option b is correct question number three a man of mass 75.2 kilograms uses a set of weighing skills to measure his mass three times he obtains the following readings. Which statement describes the precision and accuracy of the weighing scales? Okay, so accuracy is how close these three measured values are to the true mass that is 75.2 kilograms, right? Now, since the difference between these three values and the actual your true value that is 75.2 kilograms is greater than 0.1 kilograms, so we cannot say that your answers are accurate to plus or minus 0.1 kilograms so this means that a and c are already out because it says that your answers are accurate to plus or minus 0.1 kilograms all right now precision is how repeatable your values are in this chart 80.2 80.1 and 80.2 since the difference between three measured values which are these three values the difference between them is of 0.1 kilograms so we can say that our measured readings are precise to plus or minus 0.1 kilograms this means that they are precise to 0.1 kilograms and they are not accurate to plus or minus 0.1 kilograms so this means that option d is correct question number four which statement about scalar and vector quantities is correct it's obviously b because a scalar quantity is a quantity which has got just a magnitude whereas a vector quantity is something that has got magnitude and direction both question number five how can the acceleration of an object be determined um, a is incorrect because area under a displacement time graph gives you velocity so let's cancel it out area under velocity time graph gives you distance so this is out too uh, the gradient of a displacement time graph uh, lets you determine the velocity, so this is out too, hence our answer is D. 
which is the gradient of the velocity time graph that is change in a rate of change in velocity and that is acceleration Question number six, a sprinter takes a time of 11 seconds to run a 100 meter race. She first accelerates uniformly from rest. So she starts from rest, reaching a speed of 10 meters per second. I forgot to underline this, that she in total takes 11 seconds to run a 100 meter race. She then runs at a constant speed of 10 meters per second until the finish line. What is the uniform acceleration of the sprinter for the first part of the race? So they're asking you to find the acceleration for the first part of the race. For these kind of questions, it's suggested or I suggest you to draw a graph for all the motion that they have explained you over here. So I'll be drawing a velocity time graph. All right. The X and the Y axis, I'll label them velocity. And this is our time axis. Now the question says, that she starts from rest until she reaches the speed of 10 meters per second so she starts from rest that is 0 meters per second until 10 meters per second and she accelerates in uh, and she accelerates in this interval but they did not indicate the time interval for this change of acceleration so i'll assume that she moved for x seconds all right this is in seconds and this is in meters per second now the question also says that the sprinter continues to run at the speed of 10 meters per second until the end. So she continues and since this is a velocity time graph, so a constant speed means that there's going to be a straight line, uh, all right? And the total time taken for this entire race was 11 seconds. So this is going to be 11, this mark over here, because in total she takes 11 seconds for the entire race. So in the first part of the race, she accelerates, then she continues to move at a constant speed of 10 meters per second for this time interval. She, for this time interval, she travels for a constant speed and for this time interval, she travels with a constant acceleration. Okay, now the question is asking us to find the acceleration for the first X seconds. So this is the time interval. This is what they're asking you to find for how long she accelerated before she reached the speed of 10 meters per second because afterwards she continues on moving with a constant speed all right for acceleration you need the initial and the final velocity your initial speed is zero meters per second and your final speed is 10 meters per second and then you need the time interval for this change of velocity which is this and this is missing so your first task is to find the value of x now mind that uh this is also stated over here that the question also states that she runs a hundred meters in total and that is in the interval of 11 seconds and just like i discussed the previous mcq question that area under velocity time graph gives you the total distance traveled by uh, something all right so the area under the graph of the velocity time graph represents 100 meter that is the total distance that she travels so area under this graph area under the slope it forms a triangle so area of a triangle is half into base now your base is missing so we'll uh, assume that your base is of length x multiplied by the height your height is 10 meters per second so multiplied by 10 this plus area under this uh, constant our uh, area under the straight line which forms a rectangle so your base has a length of 11 minus x because this x could be 2 3 4 or 5 or anything so your base is this right so 11 minus x is your base this multiplied by your height that is 10. now this in total the sum of both is equals to the total distance that she travels now you'll have you'll get a value for x as 2 which means that the sprinter accelerated for 2 seconds and the time interval in which she travels with a constant speed of 10 meters per second was 9 seconds so 9 plus 2 gives you 11 seconds in total and hence acceleration would be your final velocity minus initial velocity by the total time taken this is equals to 5 meters per second square so this was your acceleration in the first two seconds 
when she travels with a constant acceleration. This is what they asked you to calculate. So our option D is correct. Question number seven, a single horizontal force F is applied to a block X, which is in contact with a separate block Y as shown. The blocks remain in contact as they accelerate along a horizontal frictionless surface a resistance is negligible x has a greater mass than y which statement is correct all right so while these two boxes are accelerating they remain in contact meaning that they are moving with a constant acceleration meaning that they are moving with the same acceleration for this question if we look at the formula f is equals to m into a now acceleration for both blocks is the same so the two quantities whose relationship that you need to consider is of the resultant force and the mass. All right. You need to compare both these quantities. Since uh, resultant force is directly proportional to the mass while the acceleration remains constant and your Y is of lighter mass, we can say that the resultant force on Y is going to be less than that on the block X, which is F. So it's going to be option C, where it says that the force, the resultant force that, that is exerted on X is, that is exerted on Y by X is less than the magnitude of the resultant force which is acting on the block X, and that is F. Again, I repeat that uh, you need to consider this formula while solving this kind of question, where acceleration remains constant and your F is directly proportional to M. Now, when M, which is the mass of block Y, it is lighter in weight as compared to, as compared to uh, the mass of the block X, your resultant force is expected to be less on Y as compared to the resultant force which is acting on block X, and that is capital F. All right? Question number eight. A car of mass 750 kilograms has a horizontal driving force of 2 kilonewtons acting on it. It has a forward horizontal acceleration of 2 meters per second square. What is the resistive force acting horizontally? So the car is moving with acceleration of 2 meters per second square. This means that the forces that act on the car, they are not balanced. And since it is accelerating, meaning that the driving force is greater than the resistive force, your, it says that it has a horizontal driving force of 2 kilonewtons. So we first need to write that m is equals to 750. Let's write all the data together. Your driving force is 2000 newtons. Your acceleration is two, and you need to find the resistive force. And the formula that you will be using here is resultant force is equals to m into a. Your resultant is going to be the difference between the driving force and the resistive force. So 2000 minus the resistive force is equal to the mass of the car, which is 750 kilograms into the acceleration with which it moves forward. That is 2. All right. So this way, your resistive force is going to be equal to 0.5 kilonewtons. So it's option A. Question number nine. An object falls freely from rest in a vacuum. The graph. So it falls from rest in a vacuum. The graph shows the variation with time t of the velocity v of the object. This shows a straight line through origin with a constant acceleration because your constant change in gradient is basically the constant acceleration in velocity time graph. Which graph using the same scales represents the object falling in air? So over here it's falling in air and this was falling in vacuum. All right, here it's vacuum, here it's vacuum, and here it's air. And when something falls in air, resistance is not negligible, or the resistive forces cannot be ignored. So over here, this is a straight gradient, and when something falls in air, it will never be moving with the constant acceleration. There is acceleration due to free fall, but there's always resistive force also acting on the object, which will be causing a non-constant change in axle, change in velocity uh, of the object. So A is not the answer. Now graph B, it shows that your velocity remains zero for more than 
for more than just t is equals to zero seconds which is not possible when something falls in air so your option b and d both of them they're going to be straight out now acceleration has to decrease until now when we can't ignore air resistance change in velocity will not be constant right your acceleration is not going to be constant throughout the motion when something falls in air. Acceleration has to decrease until that object reaches terminal velocity stage. This is where, uh, this is when the resistance, air resistance, is equal to the weight of that object. So decreasing acceleration has a graph of this kind, which is option C. Decreasing acceleration is represented by decreasing gradient. So this is decreasing gradient. So your option C. Question number 10, a rock of mass 2m traveling in deep space at velocity v explodes into two parts of equal mass, one of which is then stationary. So a rock of mass initially before explosion has a mass of 2m and is traveling at a velocity of v. It explodes into two parts of uh, stones and they both share the same mass uh, out of which one is a stationary and the other is moving with some speed. What is the kinetic energy of the moving part after the explosion? All right, so following the conservation, uh, following the law of conservation of momentum, your total momentum uh, remains the same before and after explosion. Before explosion, it is uh, force, uh, it is mass, uh, momentum is mass into velocity. So before explosion, it is going to be 2mv, that is mass multiplied by the velocity equals to a momentum after explosion so after explosion is split into two parts one of which then becomes a stationary so there's no momentum for that and for the other and for the other part the part will be just m multiplied by the velocity of uh, that which is unknown to us all right so m and m gets cancelled so the speed of one rock after explosion of that one rock which does not uh, become stationary after explosion it has a velocity of 2v right now the kinetic energy of that rock after explosion is going to be half into the mass of that which is m multiplied by the velocity that velocity that we calculated over here it is 2v and the square of that so this becomes 4m v squared divided by 2 and this is equals to 2m v squared this makes option d correct 11. A horizontal metal bar PQ of length 50 centimeters is hinged at end P. The diagram shows the metal bar viewed from above. Two forces of 16 newtons and 5 newtons are in the horizontal plane and act on end Q. As shown, what is the resultant moment about P due to two forces? Now, hinged at, it says hinged at end P, at point P. So this is the turning point or pivot, you could say. So this is your pivot. It says that the resultant moment is about p about p means you must take distances the the perpendicular distances from point p which is your pivot uh, until the force that you are taking in your calculation now the 16 newton force um, causes your bar to rotate anti-clockwise so this force will make this bar rotate in this direction while this force will make your bar move in the clockwise direction Remember the formula for moment is force multiplied by distance and that distance is the perpendicular distance between the pivot and the force. So your so it's better if you take the vertical component of 16 newton so that it becomes so that when you take the distance 50 centimeters it should be perpendicular distance between the force and the pivot so the vertical component of 16 newtons is going to be this angle will be 60 degrees because in total it will be 90 this is a 90 degree and you need to find the magnitude of the vertical component of 16 newtons so the vertical component will be equal to 16 cos 60 multiplied by the perpendicular distance between the force and the pivot point and that is equal to 50 centimeters so you must take 0.5 that is in meters and the 5 newton of force that causes your bar to rotate clockwise and it already has 
the perpendicular distance between the force and the point pivot P and this is perpendicular to the bar the force so the force that causes clockwise rotation so moment uh, the clockwise moment or the clockwise moment is going to be equal to force multiplied by the distance between it 2.5 newton meter now the resultant moment is going to be the difference between the total clockwise and the anti-clockwise moment so 16 cos 60 into half minus 2.5 this gives you 1.5 newton meter so it's option a 12 a cube wxzy has sides of length 2 centimeters and mass 25 24 grams the cube rests on a meter rule of negligible mass the geometrical center of the cube is vertically above the 70 centimeter mark on the scale uh, of the rule the cube has a non-uniform density um, so that its center of gravity is not at its geometrical center the center of gravity of the cube is in the plane of the diagram the rule rests on a pivot at the 50 centimeter mark a mass of 23.4 grams is placed vertically above the 30 centimeters mark the rule is horizontal and in equilibrium what can be determined about the position of the center of gravity of the cube now here it says that the rule is in equilibrium state meaning that uh, its moments are balanced anti-clockwise moment uh, due to 23.4 grams because it lets your rule move in this direction the anti-clockwise moment due to 23.4 grams uh, about 50 centimeter mark because this is acting as your pivot this is equal to the clockwise moment due to the 24.0 grams uh, of weight which lets your bar moves in the clockwise direction so following the law of conservation of moment your total anti-clockwise moment which is due to 23.4 grams this must be equal to you need to convert grams into kilograms all right multiply it with 9.81 this is equal to the force that causes the bar or that causes the scale to rotate and in the anti-clockwise direction multiplied by the distance the perpendicular distance between the force and the pivot and the pivot which is 50 minus 30 centimeters so that is 20 centimeters and you need to convert that to meters all right this must be equal to the total uh, clockwise moment which is due to 24 grams of cube now 24 divided by 1000 again multiply it with 9.81 to get the total force multiplied by the perpendicular distance between the pivot and the center of mass of this weight which is unknown to us all right because the question says that center of uh, the cube has a non-uniform density so that its center of gravity is not at its geometrical center although this is the geometrical center of this uh, cube but this is not where uh, the entire weight acts upon or the entire mass of the cube acts upon so we'll consider this distance, the, this perpendicular distance between the force, the point where the force acts upon, and the 50 centimeter mark, which is at pivot. So this in total is the distance multiplied by x. All right. So this way you get the value for x equals to 19.5 centimeters. Originally, you'll be getting an answer of 0.195, but that is in meters. So you need to convert that to centimeters. Now 19.5 centimeters, meaning that the perpendicular distance between point P pivot and the force, which is the weight of the cube and weight always acts upon the center of the mass, this is equal to 19.5 centimeters. So 50 plus 19.5 centimeters, which is equals to 69.5 centimeters, so wherever the center of mass of the cube is, it's 69.5 centimeter mark there. So this is the point where the center of mass uh, of the cube acts from, and this must be exactly vertically above the mark 69.5 centimeters. Horizontal distance between the center of mass and the line WY is 
0.5 centimeters because this is 69 and this is 69.5 so a difference of 0.5 centimeters this proves that your option c is correct it must be somewhere along a vertical line that is 0.5 centimeters from line wy 13. A rigid sphere is held at rest on the seabed. When the sphere is released, it rises to the surface of the sea. The seawater has a uniform density. Which statement about the sphere from its release until it reaches the surface is correct? Alright, so your options are that sphere always moves with constant acceleration, it moves with constant velocity, the upthrust uh, on the sphere is decreasing or it remains constant. So, D seems to be the correct answer uh, because what connects density to upthrust, which is a force, is the formula that is pressure due to liquids. Remember that there is a formula called pressure due to liquids is equal to density into G into H, where pressure could be further divided into force over area is equals to density into G into height. All right. When everything is staying constant, meaning G, which is 9.81, the height of the water, the area on which the pressure is acting, the, all three of them are remaining constant. And the question also states that the seawater has a uniform density. This means that density 2 is going to remain constant. This means that force will remain unchanged too. And the force that X uh, on the liquid is basically nothing but upthrust. So your upthrust on the sphere is always constant. 14 Watt is a unit for density. So density is equals to mass over volume. Um, this over here shows force over volume. Um, this over here shows mass over length. This shows mass over area and this, this is micrograms, micrograms means mass over millimeter and this cube per cube means that this was basically in the denominator, cube means that this is volume. So your option D is correct. Input E in in a process is partly transferred to unif useful energy output U and partly transferred to energy that is wasted W. What is the efficient efficiency of the process? So percentage efficiency is useful energy output divided by the total energy input into 100%. Your useful energy output was U divided by the total energy input which is E in multiplied by 100%. So it's option a 16 an escalator is 60 meters long and lifts passengers through a vertical height of 30 meters as shown to drive the escalator against the forces of friction when there are no passenger requires a power of 2 kilowatts the escalator is used by passengers of average mass 60 kilograms and the power to overcome friction remains constant how much power is required to drive the escalator when it is carrying 20 passengers and is traveling at a speed of 0.75 meters per second? So total mass on the escalator must be 20 because there are 20 passengers multiplied by the average mass that is 60. So that is 1200 kilograms. And the speed is 0.75 meters per second with which each person is moved from the bottom to the top all right uh, so your power needed for the passengers is equals to energy transferred divided by the time taken all right now energy transferred is force multiplied by distance but mind that this distance is nothing but the distance in the direction of the force that we are going to take over here divided by time all right now force is going to be due to the total mass of the 20 passengers that are on the escalator right now so the force is 1200 into 9.81 all right this is the force 
multiplied by the distance in the direction of the force. Now since weight of each person x downwards and the distance which is parallel to the weight of all 20 passengers is 30 meters. So your distance is going to be is not going to be 60 meters but 30 meters. So 30 divided by the total time taken for moving the, this last passenger until this point. Now, the speed that they discussed over here is 0.75 meters per second. This basically indicates that every second the accelerator moves 0.75 meters. All right, so, and the total distance traveled by the escalator is 60 meters. Overall, it takes 60 over 0.75, which is 80 seconds to transfer even this last passenger until the top of this uh, escalator. So the time is 80 seconds. This is equal to 4,414 watts of power needed for the 20 passengers. But this was only the power needed for the passengers. What about that to drive the escalator against the frictional forces that is an additional 2000 watts as discussed over here that when there are no passengers the escalator still requires 2000 watts of power to move the escalator against the forces of friction so in total there are going to be 4414 plus 2000 watts of power and this in total gives you 6414 watts of power and this makes option b correct 17. A rock of mass 40 kilograms is released from rest from a height of 20 meters above the surface of a planet. The rock has a kinetic energy of 32 kilojoules when it hits the surface of the planet. So when it reaches the surface of the planet, that is the final destination. The planet does not have an atmosphere, so the air resistance is going to be negligible. This is what uh, I could infer from this. Uh, Okay, so this infers that there is going to be zero uh, magnitude of air resistance acting on that planet surface. What is the weight of the rock on the surface of the planet? Okay, so let's write all the data together. Uh, the initial velocity with which it starts moving is zero. The total distance that it travels or the displacement is 20 meters. And uh, when it hits the planet's surface, it had uh, the final kinetic energy of 32,000 joules. This means that 32,000 is equal to the kinetic energy formula that is half into mass of the rock that is 40 multiplied by the final velocity that is v square. And you get the value for v as 40 meters per second, which means that this is also your final velocity v is equals to 40 meters per second. Now for us to be able to calculate the rock's weight because the formula for weight is m into g. Now for us to be able to calculate the rock's weight we need the acceleration due to free fall on this planet that is the value of g on this planet and as a matter of fact we have enough data to calculate that value of g. We can use the formula uh, v square is equals to u square plus 2as that is one out of four uh, sweat equations where a is equals to v square that is final velocity square 40 square minus initial velocity square divided by 2 into the displacement or the height that is 20 so this gives an acceleration of 40 meters per second square and this was the acceleration due to free fall on the planet now your weight of the rock on that planet surface is going to be mass multiplied by the acceleration due to free fall and this is equals to 1600 newtons of weight on that planet so this makes option c correct 18 a metal wire is stretched the wire obeys hooke's law which quantity has a value that does not change uh, when the wire stretches so obviously it extends so extension is not going to stay constant throughout so a is out um, stress is equals to force over area where force applied on the metal wire could change so not c either um, strain is equals to extension over original length where it could extend to any length depending on the applied force so your extension could be any value it is not going to stay constant so not strain, thus it's going to be D. 
19. An object is stretched until it reaches the elastic limit. Which statement must describe the stress on the object when it is at the elastic limit? Now for this question, I'd like to draw a graph here that shows you the elastic limit, elastic deformation and the area for the plastic deformation. So this is my graph. All right, now I'll divide my graph into three parts. Now this point over here is your limit of proportionality. This means that area under this entire triangle or area under this entire slope is where is the region where Hooke's law is observed. All right. Now, this point over here is your elastic limit. The question is specifically discussing the elastic limit. It says that an object has reached its elastic limit. Now, describe stress on the object when it is at the elastic limit. The question is asking you when it has reached the elastic limit, describe what kind of stress it is going to be. Uh, now, this was the elastic limit. Now this is going to be your, this entire region is going to represent the elastic region, meaning that when you stretch them, it can come back, the object could come back to its original position. However, this was the only portion where your object had observed the Hooke's law. Now this point over here is known as the point where your object will break. And this entire area, or the region after elastic limit, after the object has reached elastic limit, is your plastic deformation region. While this one over here is the elastic deformation. A says that it is the maximum stress for which the object obeys Hooke's law. No, the object, the region that represents Hooke's law is only until the limit of proportionality and not elastic limit. Elastic limit comes beyond uh, the region of uh, the graph where it obeys Hooke's law, right? So not A. B says that the maximum stress that can be applied to the object before it has elastic deformation. Um, no elastic limit. Uh, it, this says that elastic deformation comes beyond uh, elastic limit, while in real, it's the plastic deformation that comes after elastic limit, and elastic deformation is all this region. C, it is the maximum stress that can be applied to the object before it has plastic deformation. Uh, this could be correct because as I uh, mentioned uh, previously that all this region is plastic deformation and it comes beyond elastic limit, beyond uh, elasticity. It is the maximum stress that object can withstand before it breaks. So I mentioned before that this is the point where the object will be breaking. This comes far beyond elastic limit. So option D is incorrect too, hence it's option C. 20, which statement about progressive waves is correct? This is obviously very theoretical. You need to know that it's option D, they transfer the progressive waves, they transfer energy away from their source. 21, a cathode ray oscilloscope is used to determine the frequency of a sound wave. The diagram shows the waveform on the screen. The time-based setting is five milliseconds per division, what is the best estimate of the frequency of the sound wave? All right, so five milliseconds every division, or we could say five into 10 to the power of negative three seconds every division. And there are uh, going to be three divisions that one complete wave takes, because if we start from here, or if we start from here, this is a complete wave. So a complete wave takes three divisions and every division, uh, the time setting, the time base second is five milliseconds. So five into 10 to the power negative three second for one division and one complete wave takes three division. So in total, the time period is going to be three into five into 10 to the power of negative three seconds. Now you have, all, you have calculated the time period, which is 0 0.015 seconds and they're asking you for the best estimate of the frequency. The formula for frequency is one over time period. So one over 0 0.015, this gives you 66.7 hertz. And that is closest 
to 71 hertz so option b signal on an ambulance has a frequency of 600 hertz so your frequency of source is 600 hertz the speed of sound is 330 meters per second so this means that speed of sound in ear is 330 that is v the ambulance is traveling with a constant velocity of 25 meters per second towards an observer this means that velocity of source of sound is 25 meters per second the ambulance passes and then moves away from the observer with no change in velocity this is really important that it does not change in velocity which overall change in observed frequency takes place between the times at which the ambulance is a long way behind the observer and when it is a long way in front of the observer um, towards an observer means that the source of sound is moving closer to the observer so at this point uh, the observed frequency is going to be greater than the frequency of the source of sound and when it moves away from him away from the observer with no change in velocity this means that the observed frequency is going to be less than the frequency of the source when it's long way behind as it is mentioned here long way behind the observer it is basically approaching the observer and when the source of the sound approaches the observer like i mentioned the observed frequency is going to be greater than the frequency of the source of sound the formula observed frequency is equals to frequency of source of sound into the frequency of sound the so, uh, the speed of sound in air divided by speed of sound in air minus because it is approaching the observer speed of uh, the source of sound that is 25 and this gives you the observed frequency is 649.2 hertz and just like i mentioned that it will be greater than the frequency of the source of sound so 649.2 hertz is greater than 600 hertz right and when it is a long way in front of the observer this means that it is moving away from the observer and this time your observed frequency is going to be less than the frequency of the source of sound so again 600 into 330 divided by 330 plus this time because it is moving away from the observer with a constant uh, velocity there is going to be no change in velocity that is really important plus 25 and this gives you 557.7 hertz which is less than the frequency of the source of sound so the difference is of 649.2 minus 557.7 and that is of 91.5 hertz so it's option c 23 brief pulses of red blue and green light are emitted from the sun at the same time the pulses travel the same distance to reach mars assume that the pulses travel in a vacuum for the full duration of their journey in which order would these pulses of light arrive at mars now since the speed of all visible light waves is same in a vacuum that is the speed of light in air and that is 3 into 10 to the power of 8 meters per second a is going to be the correct answer because they all will be arriving there at the same time because they travel the same distance and they travel with the same velocity so they travel in the same inter time interval 24 two coherent progressive waves from different sources meet at a point which condition must be satisfied for there to be zero resultant amplitude at the point where the waves meet um, we know this is possible when there is this kind of drawing where you have this one wave and the other wave is out of phase completely out of phase with a phase difference of 180 degrees right this is usually when the resultant amplitude at any point is going to be zero now let's suppose uh, this was the point uh, this is the instance where we would like to find the resultant amplitude so unless uh, both these waves the out of phase waves have equal magnitude of amplitude they're not going to have a resultant amplitude of zero at any uh, time interval uh, like one has to be negative and the other has to be positive but they need to share the same magnitude like if this was plus five centimeters 
of amplitude and this was negative 5 centimeters of amplitude so resultant amplitude at this particular point of time will be zero so a is not our answer because it has nothing to do with the intensity so a is crossed out b says that they must be in phase with each other at the point while i said that this is only possible when they're out of phase when they have a phase difference of 180 degrees completely so b is out c the two waves must be traveling in opposite directions um, c is a condition for a stationary wave but not necessarily for this kind of case so c is out too uh, d says that uh, they both share the same amplitude so it's probably going to be d 25 a corridor is 13.2 meters long and has closed doors that reflect sound at both ends the speed of sound and air in the corridor is 330 meters per second what is the lowest frequency of sound that could create a stationary wave in the corridor with a node halfway along it all right a stationary wave question and it has got closed ends too so there are going to be nodes on both closed ends right so a node forms here and a node forms here uh, but how many nodes and anti nodes are going to be in the middle now the question also says that there is a node halfway along it so there is one node that is halfway along it meaning that this kind of waveform stationary waveform forms right a closed end means that there's always going to be a node forming. An open end would always have an anti-node forming at that end, while the closed ends will have nodes in them. And an additional node halfway along it means this kind of waveform, stationary waveform, will be forming. Now, this also means that the length of the corridor is going to be equal to the entire wavelength because this is a complete wave so the length of this wave is the entire wavelength right and the length of the corridor is 13.2 hence your wavelength is also going to be 13.2 meters now if you plug your value in the formula speed is equal to frequency into wavelength where speed is 330 meters per second and your wavelength is 13.2 meters is equal to frequency the lowest frequency possible is going to be 25 hertz and that is option c now to mention the fact that there could be other waveforms forming as well um, like this one a node in the middle a node at both ends so this kind of waveform would could also be forming right there has to be one node in the middle and there has to be nodes at both closed ends this could also be forming and the other uh, waveforms could also be forming following the same pattern however the question specifically asks you the waveform the kind of waveform where the lowest frequency of sound is possible now since according to the formula c is equals to f lambda where c remains constant your lambda and frequency they are inversely proportional to each other the lowest frequency means that you will have a maximum wavelength and maximum wavelength there could be if this was equal to if 13.2 originally was equal to lambda then the length 13.2 over here could be equal to 2 lambda because there are two complete waves this way lambda would have decreased to some other value right something like 6.6 .6, right if this kind of waveform was not forming an additional waveform was forming some other waveform was forming with the same pattern the 13.2 would have increased from 2 lambda to 4 lambda where your lambda will again have decreased to some other value however you need the pattern where lowest frequency meaning the maximum wavelength is forming that's why i chose this waveform pattern 26 water waves of wavelength are formed in a ripple tank the waves are diffracted as they pass through a narrow gap of width d d is greater than lambda which gap width and which wavelength will cause the largest decrease in the amount of diffraction largest decrease in the amount of diffraction and you must know that diffraction is more if the gap width which is d is less than the wavelength of your water waves 
so it's definitely not option D because you are increasing both the gap width and the wavelength which is going to cause no change and so does option A because over here you the, the change in the gap width and the change in the wavelength they are both the same so this is going to have no effect on the amount of the diffraction now option B will only will do nothing but increase the diffraction because over here you are decreasing the gap width and you're increasing the wavelength and like I mentioned that if you want more diffraction you will need to have a shorter gap width and a water wave that has a greater wavelength so you're increasing the wavelength and you are decreasing the gap width so definitely not B it is contradicting completely the largest decrease in the amount of diffraction hence it's option C that is your answer 27 two loudspeakers X and Y emit sound waves that are in phase and of wavelength 0.75 meters so they both are in phase and they share the same wavelength of 0.75 meters an observer O is able to stand anywhere on a straight line that passes through X and Y as shown the observer stands at a point where the sound waves from X and Y meet in phase so when the waves that are emitted from the sources x and y they meet at o they meet in phase what could be the distances o y and x y so the question is asking you to find this distance and this distance all right and uh, now uh, this is a kind of a constructive interference question where uh, when the two waves meet they are in phase so this is a sign for a constructive interference where your path difference is going to be um, lambda or 2 lambda or 3 lambda or something like that where there is a natural number next to the lambdas so it's basically n lambda where n is any natural number now the choice a and b they are going to be straight out uh, because your oy distance needs to be a lot greater than xy over here you see 1.25 is almost the half of 3.5 and uh, 2 is less than 2.75 while over here you see the distance between the observer and the uh, the speaker y is a lot greater than the distance between the two sources of sound so uh, so both a and b are out now since oy is 2.75 and xy is 2 so i'll level it here this is 2.75 this this over here is 2 meters so this will be the distance ox will be 0.75 right this is 0.75 distance xy and distance ox they have a huge difference and like it is mentioned over here that both waves move uh, with a phase difference of zero on or they are in phase while they're moving and they meet while they are in phase and they both share the same wavelength the huge difference between ox and xy 0.75 and the distance two meters uh, this does not go in sync with the statement that they share the same wavelength and they are in phase when they meet so it's probably going to be d 28 light of a single wavelength is incident normally on a diffraction grating. The resulting diffraction pattern is displayed on a screen with change makes the first orders of intensity maxima further apart from each other on the screen. So questions dealing with diffraction grating use the formula pi n equals to d sine theta where when theta increases and theta increases in this question because intensity maxima is going further apart that means that your theta angle or the angle between the uh, between the uh, incident ray and your first maxima is going to increase and when theta increases your value for sine theta increases too right and your value for lambda and value for n which is one in this question they are going to stay constant this means that it's d which must change the value for d must change and since they the d and sine theta they share inverse relationship and sine theta is increasing which means d must decrease d is nothing but the uh, spacing between adjacent slits so the option 
B is going to be correct where it says that less separation between adjacent slits, meaning you are decreasing the value for D. 29. For a current carrying wire, the current can be calculated using the equation shown. What is the meaning of N? So you must know that N represents the number of charge carriers per unit volume of the wire. 30. The number of free electrons passing a point in a wire in 24 hours is 6 into 10 to the power of 23. What is the average current in the wire? So current is equals to total charge over time. Now total charge is further divided into number of electrons into charge of each electron. That is 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 divided by time, which is in hours. You need to convert that to seconds. 24 into 3600. Now this gives you 1.1 uh, ampere, so B is the correct answer. 31 in the circuit shown, lamp P is rated 250 volts, 50 watts, and lamp Q is rated 250 volts, 200 watts. The two lamps are connected in series to a 250 volts uh, power supply. Assume that the resistance of each lamp remains constant. Which statement most accurately describes what happens when the switch is closed? Um, now, for us to know how much current both these lamps P and Q get and the power the circuit could supply to each of the two lamps, we ought to first find the resistance of each lamp, right? Now, using the formula, P is equals to V squared by R because we are given with the value for P of each lamp and the value for V for each lamp. We can easily calculate the resistance of each lamp, right? So resistance is equals to V squared over P. Resistance for lamp P is going to be equal to the reading on lamp P, which is 250 square divided by 50. This is equals to, so the resistance of lamp P is equals to 1250 ohms. And similarly for lamp Q, it is labeled with this. So 250 square divided by 200 and hence the resistance of lamp Q is equals to 312.5 ohm. And the combined resistance of this loop is going to be 312.5 plus 1250 since they're connected in series and this is equals to 1562.5 ohm right now use the formula r is equals to v over i in order to get the current across the loop so current equals to the emf of the battery that is 250 divided by the combined resistance of the loop that is 1562.5 and this is equals to 0.16 amperes. All right, this was the current that flows across the loop. Now, in order for us to calculate the power that is emitted by each lamp, we're going to use the formula P is equals to IV, where I is the current that flows across the circuit and V is the potential difference that is across each lamp. Uh, current is going to stay the same for both lamps because both these lamps are connected in series so current is not divided while the value of v is going to be different for both these lamps because 250 volts will be divided uh, into pd across p and pd across lamp q so pd across first of all you need the pd across lamp p this is equals to the total emf that is 250 multiplied by the resistance of p because we are calculating the voltage across p so we'll take one two five zero divided by the combined resistance of the lamps that are in series so one two five zero plus three one two point five all right this is the pd uh, across lamp p you need to multiply this uh, with the current across the circuit that is 0.16 and you will have the power that is emitted uh, by lamp P equals to 32 watts. Now power emitted by lamp Q is going to be again current multiplied by the PD across lamp Q. So again total EMF multiplied by resistance of lamp Q this time because we are calculating PD across lamp Q. 
divided by the combined resistance of the lamps in series. Now this gives you the value of power emitted by lamp Q as 8 watts. Now if you compare the power emitted by lamp Q and power emitted by lamp P, it is 4 times the value of power emitted by lamp Q. So the correct answer is lamp P emits 4 times as much power as lamp Q. 32. A piece of wire has a length of 0.8 meters and a diameter of 5 into 10 to the power of negative 4 meters. The IV characteristic of the wire is shown. What is the resistivity of the metal from which the wire is made? Now since there is a straight line with a constant change in gradient on an IV graph, this means that this is the IV characteristic of an ohmic conductor and for an ohmic conductor we can use the formula resistance is equal to resistivity into length over cross-sectional area. All right, we need to find the resistivity. So resistivity is equals to resistance into cross-sectional area over the length of wire. Now resistance of the metal, we can calculate that by using the formula R is equals to V over I. We can get some values of V and I in order to find the value for R. When there is a current of 2.5 amperes, there is a PD of five. So R is equals to V over I. So we can take 5 over 2.5 multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the wire. And cross-sectional area of the wire is always pi r squared because the cross-section of the wire is uh, in the form of a circle. So pi r squared. Now they have given you the diameter. So you need to convert that to radius. It will be 2.5 into 10 to the power of negative 4 square. This whole divided by the length of the wire, which is 0.8 meters. Now this will be equal to option C, 4.9 into 10 to the power of negative 7 ohm meter. 33, 10 cells each of EMF 1.5 volts are connected together as shown. What is the combined EMF between terminals X and Y? So the first nine cells starting from here until here, they have their opposite poles facing each other, meaning negative of this is facing the positive of this, and this continues until this cell. So the sum of the individual EMFs to get the EMF of the battery. So I'll multiply 1.5 into 9. However, the last cell that you see over here has its negative pole facing the negative of this cell. So I'll subtract the EMF of this one cell with the combined EMF of the first nine cells. So we'll subtract 1.5 from it and you will have the combined EMF of the battery as 12 volts. So this is option C. 34, a cell of EMF E and internal resistance R is connected to a variable resistor as shown. The resistance of the variable resistor is gradually increased from R to 3R. All right, when the resistance of the variable resistor increases from R to three times of R, the combined resistance of the entire loop um, as a result will increase which will discard both B and D because both graph B and D show that your uh, voltage or the PD across um, both the resistor, both kind of resistors will increase as the resistance of the variable resistor is gradually increased from small r to uh, three times of small r. Now A and C are left. Best way to solve these kind of questions is to assign some mock values to uh, your constants like E and R. So I'll assume that my E is 12 volts and the value for small r is 1 ohm. Now initially the resistance of the variable resistor is R because it is increased from R to this 3R. Right. So when this is 1 ohm and this is also 1 ohm and the EMF is 12 volts, this means that the current across the loop is going to be equal to 12 over the combined resistance of the loop that is 1 plus 1 and that is 6 amperes, right? 6 amperes of current uh, flows across the uh, circuit and the value for capital V is going to be equal to the combined EMF, that is uh, the EMF of the battery multiplied by the resistance of this. divided by the combined resistance that is 1 plus 1. So this is 6 volts. 
right now capital V is equals to 6 volts and the remaining volts will be that of this internal resistance that is another 6 volts. So initially when the resistance of the variable resistor is equal to that of the internal resistor, uh, your initial EMF, uh, your initial PD of both the resistors is going to be half of what the EMF is. So 12 volts is your EMF and 6 volts is, is the PD for both the resistors. So both A and B show that the initial PDs across the resistors is 0.5 of E, which is true, right? Let's move on to the next part. Um, now your small r is increased to 3r, which means that now this will be increased to three times of what the resistance of the internal resistor is, that is 3 ohms now. So your new, uh, now your new PD across the variable resistor is going to be the EMF multiplied by the value of resistance divided by the combined resistance, that is 3 plus 1, and this is equal to 36 over 4, which is equal to 9 volts, right? At this time, when your capital V was 6 volts, your small v was equal to 6 volts as well. And now when the resistance of the re variable resistor was increased to 3 times of its initial resistance, that is now 3 ohms, your value for capital V, that is PD, across the variable resistor equals to 9, cap 9 volts, while that across the variable resistor is going to be 12 minus 9, that is 3 volts. Now, do you see the change from the initial PDs across the variable resistor and the internal resistor to the final ones? The PD across the internal resistor, which changed from 6 volts to 3 volts, while the PD across the variable resistor was changed from 6 volts to 9 volts. So, the PD across the internal resistor had decreased, while that across the variable resistor had increased. 6 volts to 3 volts means there was a change of half of the EMF. I mean, uh, initially it was 6 volts, so that was half of the EMF, 0.5 of EMF, that is 0.5 of uh, half of 12 volts, and that is 6 volts. And the final was 3 volts, which is exactly 1 by 4 of your EMF, that is 3 volts. And that was 3 volts. So this is correct. And now, uh, looking for the variable resistor, the initial um, PD across the variable resistor was 6 volts because again half of your EMF that was 12 volts so half of 12 was 6 volts and the final PD would be 3 by 4 into 12 so this makes 9 volts right so this over here is 0.75 of E and this was 9 volts so this makes option A correct 35 each of Kirchhoff's two laws presumes that some quantity is conserved. Which row states Kirchhoff's first law and names the quantity that is conserved? So Kirchhoff's first law deals with current sum. So C and D are out. And the quantity that is conserved is charge. So A is the correct answer. 36. A cell has an EMF of 8 volts and negligible internal resistance. The cell forms part of a circuit as shown. The reading V1 is 4 volts, that is PD across this resistor having a resistance of capital R. The PD across it is 4 volts and the reading V2 is also 4 volts. So the, resist, uh, the PD across this parallel connection of 4 and 4 ohms is 4 volts. What is the resistance of resistor R, meaning they are asking you to find the value for this capital R. Now since uh, this resistor is connected in series with the parallel connection of these 4 and 4 ohms, we can use the formula V out equals to V in into the resistor R divided by the combined resistance of uh, the resistors in series. Now the combined resistance, this is unknown plus the combined resistance of these two uh, resistors which are connected in parallel so this will be 2 ohms right your V out is V1 which is 4 volts now the V in for the entire circuit was 8 volts so 8 into the resistance of 
the resistor R, which is unknown to us, divided by the combined EMF, uh, the combined resistance of the circuit. So this is in series with the parallel connection of this. So R plus the combined resistance of this loop is 2 ohms. So this is 4R plus 8 equals to 8R. This means that the value for R is 2 ohms. And thus B is correct. 37. In the circuit shown, the cells have negligible internal resistance and the reading on the galvanometer is 0. So the reading of the galvanometer is 0. It deflects to 0. What is the value of resistor capital R? Now, 0 on the galvanometer indicates and there is no current flowing across the galvanometer, which also means that whatever in volts was here is going to be exactly that is here. Right? Now, 9 ohms and... 3 ohms they are connected in series both these resistors they are connected in series which means that uh, we can calculate the pd across this 9 ohms in order to assign the same over here now emf that is supplied to both these resistors is 4 volts so we can use the formula v out equals to v in into r1 divided by r1 plus r2 now we need to find the voltage or the pd across 9 ohms so the EMF that is provided to both these resistors is 4 multiplied by, since we are finding the PD across this 9 ohms, we are going to have R1 as 9 ohms divided by 9 plus 3. This is equals to 3 volts. Now 3 volts was the potential difference at this point, meaning that there will be 3 volts of potential difference here as well. And now to mention the fact that these two resistors were given the EMF of 9 volts and 3 volts was the potential difference across this resistor. This means that the potential difference across this resistor is going to be the difference between the EMF and the potential difference across 6 ohms and is going to be 6 volts over here. Right Now that you know the potential difference across this resistor, you can easily find out the value of R by using the same exact same formula because these two are also connected in series, right? So V out, your V out is 6 volts for this resistor is equals to V in the EMF provided to both these resistors is, going, is 9 multiplied by the value for R, which is unknown to us, divided by R plus 6 ohms this 6 ohms now this is equals to 6 r plus 36 is equals to 9 r and your value for r is going to be 12 ohms so option c 38 when alpha particles are directed at gold leaf one almost all alpha particles pass through without deflection two a few alpha particles are deviated through a large angles what are the reasons for these effects? One explains gold nucleus is very small, so most alpha particles miss all nuclei. And since there is vacuum space, there is a lot of vacuum space around the uh, gold nucleus. They take the straight path and they pass without being deflected. And two was occasionally the path of an alpha particle is close to a nucleus. Because if you imagine this is your gold nucleus and the alpha particles are coming in this direction, some of them will come here and will be completely reflecting through smaller angles. This means that they hit directly the center of the gold nucleus and since both are positively charged, so they will be uh, repelling each other due to like charges and some of them will be reflected completely back in the same direction or almost the same direction. Now two explains that a few particles will be neither too close nor too far away from the nucleus. So they will be uh, deviating through larger angles like this. All right. And uh, one explains that almost all the particles will be too far away from the gold nucleus, uh, tr almost traveling in a vacuum. That is the space around the gold nucleus and they will be uh, not changing their direction. They'll take a straight up path and they will uh, have that kind of flow. So option C is your answer. 39 in nucleus X is radioactive and decays into a nucleus Y. X and Y are isotopes of the same element. Which combination of particles could have been emitted through during the decay process? All right, this means that X and Y, since they are both isotopes of the same element, they share the same proton number but different nucleon number. Um, assume that um, X had a nucleon number of 24 and a proton number of 12. This emits Y, which is an isotope of X. 
so they'll have the same proton number but different nucleon number and we have been given the choice of an alpha particle and a beta particle but we don't know yet how many um, numbers of alpha particles will be there and beta particles will be there but we know that there um, a nucleon number of an alpha particle and proton number of an alpha particle similarly the nucleon and the alpha the proton number of the beta particle we know that they're fixed so i have uh, written them over here that four two zero and negative one now in order for us to balance the charge or to balance the proton number over here it's 12 and it's 12 again over here so if we add one alpha particle over here that will be 12 plus 2 that is 14 and one beta particle that will be 14 minus 1 and that will give you negative since 12 is not equal to 13 we will be cancelling out a now coming to b if we add one alpha particle so 12 plus 2 that is 14 now plus if we add two beta particles this will be 2 into negative 1 that will be negative 2 and this will give you 12 now 12 is equals to 12 you have conserved the charge so the correct answer is option b 40 a positively charged mason uh, consists of a quark and an anti-quark what could be the quark and anti-quark so so a positively charged mason means that it carries a charge of positive one of electron charge now since an up quark is carries a charge of positive two three two over three electron charge and an anti strange quark carries a charge of positive one over three electron charge so when you add them up this will give you a combined charge of positive one electron charge which means that option d is the correct answer so this was the end of the paper thank you for watching